Hi, my name's Kevin Hicks. Welcome to my YouTube channel, The History Squad. Now, today's video has been voted in by my Patreon members. Hey, guys, thanks a million. It's a bit of a dark subject, really. It's about the burial practices of Victorian London, around about the 1830s, 40s, to be precise. This focuses on a Baptist minister who managed to bury an excessor, they say, of 12,000 bodies in the cellars, the basement of his chapel. So, to Victorian London we shall make, well actually it's just before Queen Victoria come to the throne, 1822. And we're going to Clements Lane, just off the Strand, where a Mr W House has founded a ministry and purchased a chapel, the Enon Chapel. This is a financial enterprise because people can worship upstairs and be buried downstairs at a cost, you understand. Before we start the story of the Enon Chapel, we need to lay a little bit of a foundation. The area that the chapel was located was very poor indeed. It was slums, people living on the breadline from hand to mouth. It was absolutely awful. If you'd have seen my film about the victims of the Ripper, it was that kind of an area. Now, if you have children, infant mortality rate was between 30 and 40%. That is incredible and so devastatingly sad. One of your family dies. I've got it written down here. Cost of a funeral for a child, one pound, 10 shillings and tuppence. That's 102 pounds in modern English money. Uh, if an adult dies, that's one pound, 17 shillings and tuppence. That's 126 pounds in modern English money. This was so bad because a labourer made three shillings and nine pence a day. That's the equivalent of £12.70 in modern money. So if he has a death in his family and he lives in, in a single room, crowded room, 14, 15 people in one room, he's got to save up to have a funeral so the body will be wrapped and stored in that room, under the bed maybe. And then along comes Mr Howes, and the Enon Chapel. He will charge you 15 shillings for a funeral, half the price of the local churches. And what makes this more attractive? No questions asked. Has your child been baptised? What's the cause of death? Nothing like that at all. It's a 15 shilling funeral and it's not in the churchyard. That means the body snatchers can't have it so your loved one doesn't end up on the dissecting table. No, they're going to be stored, buried, Call it what you will, in the cellars underneath the chapel, so you can worship above whilst they slumber on below. It's amazing, really, when you look into this Enon Chapel, major scandal, 1839. And you've got to ask yourself, how do we know so much about it? Well, it starts with the Commissioner of the Sewers, because you see diagonal running through the cellar of the Enon Chapel was an open sewer. There have been complaints all the way round the neighbourhood of the terrible stench coming out of the Enon Chapel. So they naturally assumed it was the, uh, the sewers. So the commissioner went down and what does he find? A scene of abject horror. Bodies piled up, coffins piled up, smashed up coffins. And what he suggests to Mr Howes is that he builds an archway over the sewer enclosing it. And doesn't do anything else. No repercussions about these bodies all over the place. Even some part body parts apparently had floated down the sewer. No, he's allowed to carry on. But what he did do was he dug out part of the sewer and there were 60 wagon loads of soil that was contaminated with bone, body parts, human tissue. They were dumped the other side of Waterloo Bridge, where they were constructing a new footpath. Some of it, so they say, was dumped straight into the River Thames. However, carelessly, some baskets of this contaminated soil were given to some uh, builders who were repairing a path. And when they emptied out this soil, a human hand appeared. There was an outcry, but still nothing was done. Mr. House continued burying 500 people in the cellars of the Enon Chapel 
every year till his death in 1842. Think about that. What did he do with them? So how on earth did Mr. Howes manage to bury 500 bodies a year in the cellar of Enon Chapel? Such a confined space, 59 feet by 12 feet. Well, to help us out, I've done a drawing. Let's take a look. So here's my drawing. Well, basically, it's a plan of the Enon Chapel cellars. Uh, if you think about it, 12 foot wide by 59 feet along and only 6 foot tall. We have an open sewer running through it, which must have been disgusting in its own right. Stacks of coffins from floor to ceiling. And then broken coffin bits waiting to be taken upstairs and be burnt by Mr. Howes and his wife in their house. But then the bone pits, and I'll try and explain this a little bit better. You imagine that is the floor of the chapel. He digs down. He makes these burial pits. He then stacks your bodies one on top of the other, covers them with quicklime and a little bit of soil. Now, what I read, so he's covered them with quicklime, but one of the pits must have contained coffins because one of the witnesses reckons that as you walked along the surface of the chapel cellars, you were actually walking, there's somebody walking, on coffin lids. But he rotated these. So once he'd got them to rot down into bones, he would take them up and then somewhere along here, he would stack all of the bones up, even floating them along the sewers and discreetly disposing of them by the wagon load into the River Thames. He had an entire production line going, but the stench from all of these bodies rotting in the coffins, the decomposition in the bone pits, it must have been unbelievable. We actually have a witness to the vault under the Enon Chapel. His name was George Walker, nicknamed George Graveyard Walker. Mr. Walker was actually a surgeon and an advocate of public health. He campaigned tirelessly for better burial practices. Now, he left us a statement, a witness statement of what he saw in the vaults under the Enon Chapel. And I've got part of one here. This is what he said. Vast numbers of bodies have been placed here in pits, dug for the purpose, the uppermost of which were covered only by a few inches of earth. Soon after interments were made, a peculiarly long, narrow black fly was observed to crawl out of many of the coffins. This insect, a product of the putrefication of the bodies, was observed on the following season to be succeeded by another, which had the appearance of a common bug with wings. The children attending the Sunday school held in this chapel, in which these insects were to be seen crawling and flying in vast numbers, called them body bugs. We have another witness to the state of the Enon Chapel. He was actually a member of the uh, congregation. He was a cabinet maker and he attended the chapel from 1828 to 1835. Now he made a statement to a parliamentary committee with regards to what had gone on. And this is a copy of what he said. At the time I attended it, there were interments and the place was in a very filthy state. The smell was most abominable and very injurious. I have frequently gone home myself with a severe headache, which I suppose to have been occasioned by the smell, more particularly in the summertime. Also, there were insects, something similar to a bug in shape and appearance, only with wings about the size of a small bug. I have seen them in the summertime, hundreds of them flying about the chapel. I have taken them home in my hat, and my wife has taken them home in her clothes. We always considered that they proceeded from the dead bodies underneath. Can you imagine that? In 1842, the Baptist minister, Mr. Howes, dies. So the burials cease. And in 1844, a Mr. Fitzpatrick takes up residence in the Enon Chapel. But he finds that the kitchen ceiling is too low. So he employs a builder on his day off on a Sunday to come and do 
some alterations in the kitchen. The builder lifts all the flagstones up because he's going to dig down into the floor to make more room in the kitchen. As soon as he lifts up the flagstones, you've guessed it, he finds bones. Well, this is an enterprising builder and Mr. Fitzpatrick is in on it as well. So they clear all the bones out of the ground and then dig a hole even deeper than the floor level they want for the kitchen. Put all of the bones into there, fill it in and then lay a new kitchen floor. Job done. Well, it would appear that Mr. Fitzpatrick wasn't that happy with his new kitchen in Enon Chapel after all, because he moved out. But we do know that come 1847, the chapel was acquired by a group of teetotalers who reopened Enon Chapel as a dance hall. And their tagline, you've got to love this, was Dancing on the Dead. Now their handout, their bill, if you like, read... Enon Chapel, Dancing on the Dead. Admission three pence, no lady or gentleman admitted unless wearing shoes and stockings. What a great advert. It's amazing how this ends up because George Graveyard Walker in 1848 purchased the Enon Chapel and promised to give all of the bodies buried in there a decent burial. But he didn't do it discreetly. He was a bit of a showman. He invited the public in, no charge, but contributions were accepted. They will help for the reinterment of the bodies. To encourage people to come, he had attendants walking up and down the local area with a skull in their hands. That would encourage or entice your death lovers of Victorian London to come and have a look. In fact, 6,000 people came down to Enon Chapel, climbed down into that cellar to view the great pyramid of bones. The highlight of the Enon tour was when the visitors got to gaze upon the shriveled face of the long dead Mr. Howes. His body must have been placed down in the cellar amongst all of those bones. That's what you call poetic justice, isn't it? But all of those remains were reinterred in Norwood Cemetery and to this very day they lie there still, sadly, in an unmarked grave. Sadly, this is just the tip of the iceberg. The scandal of the Enon Chapel was just one scandal amongst many concerning the private burial places of the City of London. We haven't even touched on the boneyards yet, so uh, stay tuned, there's more to come. Well, I hope you found our little film interesting. Bit of a dark subject, that's for sure. If you did, like, share and subscribe. And don't forget to turn on the all notification button. But before I go, a quick shout out to some of our new Patreon members. David Lewis, Alexandra Lofgreen and someone who signs themselves simply as David. Welcome aboard, guys. Bye for now.